Welcome to the Craftsman Founder Podcast, hosted by Lucas Carlson. Every week, we talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and those who've made a craft out of creating companies and enterprises. Listen every week to get ideas for starting, promoting, and growing your business. There are no shortcuts, just good old-fashioned hard work and craft. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's interview. So this week, uh, we, in, we talked to Mike Belsito and um, about how to raise venture capital outside of Silicon Valley, and it was a really, really nice conversation, smart dude, and I near and dear to my heart is because I built my company in Portland and, and um, raised money in the Bay Area, and so, so this is a topic that it is very familiar to me, and I know a lot of people listening probably uh, struggle with this concept too, so I'm, I'm excited about the interview. Yeah, me too. You know, I, I've, uh, I, I worked both as an early employee and on the venture side of the table outside of Silicon Valley down in San Diego. And so this was also near and dear to my heart. You know, when you're, uh, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're an investor, uh, Silicon Valley is sort of always the elephant in the room. Um, but that's not where the best companies always get built, far from it. Um, I actually, there was a, uh, just this week, there was a great New Yorker profile on Mark Andreessen. Yeah, that was a good one. The, yeah, co-founders of Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, and I, I can't remember the exact line, so don't don't take me on the statistic. You'll have to Google it. But uh, something like more than half of the billion-dollar companies over the past decade have been built outside of Silicon Valley. Yeah, and so you know that that's something to keep in mind, and and it's also something to keep in mind when you're an entrepreneur and, and you're you're trying to you know your your startup needs money and you're trying to raise it and you don't know where to go. Yep, totally. Um, on a slightly different topic, uh, are you into privacy and security stuff? Me personally, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I I find it really interesting. In fact. I don't know if I've already recommended this book to you, but have you have, you, have I told you about Future Crimes? No. By Mark Goodman. Didn't they make this a movie is, of that? No, no, it just came out. It's nonfiction. Um, uh, Mark was a uh, Mark was the futurist advisor to the FBI. Nice. And um, so he, he he advises the FBI. We on should technology. try to get that guy on our podcast. Was he on the? I mean, um, was he on the Tim Ferriss podcast recently? Do you know? He was last year, I think, yeah. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, it would be great to get him on the podcast. I think he is somewhat in demand. Uh, his book is like a major bestseller, so we would need to find him in. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it's his book is the nonfiction book I have recommended most this year, for sure. Nice. Um, it is. So if you're interested in privacy and security issues, this is an absolute must-read. I mean, it's just like, it's the best book I've ever read on the subject. Yeah, it's one of those things that um, I've been obsessed about on and off for a very long time, and um, it's one of those things that uh, I, I love privacy and security, uh, but I also love to have like a balance of privacy and security, but not getting in my way of a workflow that kind of lets me, um, uh, you know, deal with email the way I'm used to, deal with my phone the way I'm used to. I don't want to have to like put my uh, photos in a special application that has a lock behind it. It's like that, that's too much of a hassle for me, but I still want privacy and security. And so, um, uh, I've I've collected uh, a list of tools, and I'm curious if uh, if if you use any of these. But um, have you used any VPN on your phone before? No. So I have. Uh, I'm a big fan of VPNs uh, for many many reasons. Net neutrality is one of the big ones. Uh, but um, uh, privacy, security. Uh, you know, th just think about it. Like every email that you send is being scooped up by at least one major government, if not multiple governments, right? Mm -hmm. And stored, right? And every email you send has your originating IP on it. Mm -hmm. So, and every originating IP has a, a pretty good geolocation on it. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is sitting there in, in intercepting um, through SMTP servers somewhere in the middle, 
and collecting all the emails. They're, they know where you are, when you are, historically, for all time. Yep. Without even reading your email, they just have to look at one of the... That's yeah, um, just the metadata. One of the metadata. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, with using a VPN, all of the uh, originating IPs come from the VPN. And so VPN on an iPhone is not easy to get right because um, iPhones like to shut down everything when you lock. So uh, what happens is you set up the VPN connection and then you lock your phone and five minutes later you unlock it and you're no longer VPN. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who's like, okay, well, I'm going to go back into my settings and turn on VPN again. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, there, there's an auto reconnect feature, but it almost never works for most VPNs. And I've tried mm. like probably about a dozen VPN apps on my phone, uh, and I found one that does a good job auto reconnecting and uh, has no speed issues. Because I've I've had some that reconnect okay, but have speed issues. I I had. They do have one issue, which is that uploads are um, capped because they don't want you to be bit torrenting on your phone, which is ridiculous. Like, who does that? But like, uh, you could <laughs> you could, but uh, <laughs> but they uh, they do uh, do that, which is not great. But to balance that out, one of the board members of this company is um, uh, on the EFF. So that makes it more trustworthy, and so I, I like that a lot. So it's um, Surf Easy uh, VPN. So if you just go to the App Store and search for Surf Easy, uh, it's the best VPN on my phone. I keep it on all the time. Everything I do is behind a VPN on my phone, and I love it. I love that um, everything's encrypted. Uh, my phone provider can't see what uh, websites I'm accessing, can't keep logs uh, of my Google searches. Um, and actually, that's on my desktop. One of my favorite new apps that I found was um, uh, it's a uh, web plugin for your browser uh, called Disconnect Me Search Plugin. Now, Disconnect Me has like three plugins for your browser. They have a browser plugin. They have like uh, they they have three plugins. But the one that I absolutely love is the Disconnect Me Search Plugin. And what it does is, uh, I hate that Google tracks your searches, keeps a history, keeps logs, that your ISP is watching for your requests to Google, and they're keeping logs of what you're searching for. I think that's ridiculous. Um, and so what Disconnect Me Search Plugin does is it will, so I've tried using things like DuckDuckGo, and I love the concept of DuckDuckGo, but the search results just aren't good enough. Like every time I try it, I'm like, okay, it's okay, but like that's not what I was looking for. And Google's just the best search engine out there. It's just like you can't yeah. get around that. Disconnect Me search plugin will, when you search for something on Google, it actually goes through a Disconnect Me site instead, which is a proxy, giving you the uh, Google results through the Disconnect Me search web. So the, the Disconnect sure. Me server uh, is the only thing that interacts with, with Google, not my mm -hmm. browser. And, um, and so I get the results, but through, uh, through that extra layer, that extra buffer of protection, uh, mm -hmm. which I like a lot. Yeah, no, that's very cool. Have you read the other, the other book I'd recommend on that one is... Information doesn't want to be free. It's Cory Doctorow. Yep. I don't know if you've read that. I've heard of that one. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, that, it it has a different angle. It's not about like it's not particularly about surveillance, uh, but it is very relevant to these issues, and I think you'd really enjoy it. Yeah. Well, th that's the other thing is, um, uh, for example, one of my other favorite. Uh, apps that I came across recently was uh, a thing called Tweet Delete, and it's tweetdelete.net. Uh, and what it'll do is it'll go and delete any tweets older than whatever you want, older than a month, older than two months, older than two weeks, uh, and mm -hmm. just delete them. And why not? Why do people 
like have no problem with the fact that tweets are stored forever and Facebook is stored forever. Like <laughs> it's, it's social media. So it's in the moment and there's no reason for a tweet to go back more than two weeks. What use, what value do old tweets have? Old blog posts, they have tons of value. They create search engines value. They, they have lots of, uh, uh, of information. It's in context. It, so they have lots of value to stay around, archival value. But tweets, what are It creates value for Twitter. <laughs> but it has <laughs> no, like sell ads. But it has no value for <laughs> me, the tweeter, nor you. you when's the last time you go back know. You know, sure. three months on somebody's Twitter account to see what they said three months ago? The only time you do right. that is if you're suing them and you're trying to find ways to find something that they said that's incriminating. <laughs> so uh, tweet delete will automatically, without you thinking about it, delete all your tweets older than two weeks old. Mm. Um, so I use that. I use uh, Facebook Remover, which is a browser plugin that deletes my Facebook that's older than two weeks. Because same thing, what's the use? Nobody goes back in history. Uh, you can download your own personal copy if you want your history. Facebook lets you download an archive of all your Facebook activity. Then you can delete it all. It's uh, it just doesn't need to be out there. So these are just something. I have a whole list. I could keep going on forever, but uh, these are some of my favorite new ones. Mm. Yeah, no, that's cool. And you definitely like you, the Mark Goodman book. You're gonna get. It's gonna blow your mind. It's yeah. gonna be all. Awesome. And and uh, as a, as an aside, um, I feel like there are like five or six uh, like premises for techno thriller novels in each chapter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start so, yeah. writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Cool. cool. So should we uh, should we record our intro? Uh, we already did. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> I was just having a conversation, but that's awesome. That's the, that's that's the, how I thought it would be the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's ninja status. Yeah, I like that. Yep. So I was under surveillance without my knowledge. You were. <laughs> It'll be held against you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The the, uh, the Skype delete. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, you'll you'll love that for sure. Um, and it would, yeah, I mean, it would be awesome to interview him at some point. We'll just have to find a, a sneaky sneaky intro. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, you know, it's just, it's interesting how, how much, you know, just, just, you know, as we mentioned Mark and Dreesen earlier, software is eating the world, but, you know, with, with that scale comes scaled vulnerabilities as well. Yes. Um, you know, it's like, it's, it's a lot easier to steal like 25 cents from 14 million bank accounts than to rob a bank. <laughs> and there's a lot less risk. There's, you know, it's it's like it's a really yeah. It's it's uh, I mean, and, and that's a very mundane example. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, but 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 it really is pretty pretty. Yeah. I mean, there's it's pretty scary. Yep. Um, uh, it's pretty scary just because there's so much out there that we haven't really uh, we haven't seen a lot of yet. I mean, it's sort of funny. Like we see we look at the Sony hack and like these things as like. And uh, uh, as as being and Stuxnet as being like oh look at those like big deals right but you know like the more shocking thing to me is that like the what is it I think the the uh, the average uh, the the average time that it takes for for an organization that spends a lot of money on security to even discover that they've been infiltrated, that they've been hacked in some way or another, the average time is like over a year. Yeah. So if, if like, I mean, like that is just shocking. It's like if, oh yeah, like we've had burglars inside our headquarters, <laughs> like alongside us yep. for a year. Oops. <laughs> like, yeah, whoops. It's not like, oh, shattered windows, shit. Like we need to do something, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I think that there's a, yeah, I mean, it's scary as a, as a consumer and, and as a business person. Um, 
It's also wonderful as an author, yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just one of those things where we haven't, I feel like we haven't really learned to think in those terms yet. Totally. Um, and luckily many, like, although a lot of bad guys have learned to think of those terms, not that many have. Yep. Right. So like that, that's a good thing too. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other super simple thing you can do for increased privacy, um, that works really great, even it, like especially if you're using a VPN on your phone, like SurfEasy. Mm. Start making um, uh, FaceTime voice calls instead of regular voice calls. FaceTime voice, but why? Because it was one of it's one of the most like it was the biggest feature of iOS seven. And it's like the least used, most forgotten thing that Apple's ever created. And what it hmm. does is, all it does is, it's like a Skype voice call. Yeah, it's just voice over IP. Voice yeah. over IP, which works great when you're on a VPN, because it's all VPN traffic. So there's hmm. no way for your ISP to track that it's, uh, a, a, you're making a phone call. Uh, hmm. And there's no way for... Uh, it, it's highly secured. It's encrypted by Apple and then encrypted by the VPN. Uh, mm. The sound quality, you're going to be surprised. Nobody's ever tried FaceTime audio. And so when they try it for the first time, they realize the sound quality is awesome. FaceTime yeah. audio quality, way better than a phone call. So it's not only better privacy, better security, it's also uh, much higher quality voice uh, so, so you get that benefit too. Now here's the trick. Hmm. The trick is, again, you, you don't want to have to do things that take you out of your normal routine. Just go in through your contacts, delete on your favorites, delete people that have FaceTime audio, and re-add them with FaceTime audio being the default in the favorites list. And then when you click them, it'll automatically do a FaceTime audio call, and you won't have to like click any fancy buttons to try to find FaceTime audio. Mm. And uh, every all iPhones, uh, it works on all iPhones. So you don't have to like explain to your mother how FaceTime audio works. She'll just get a phone call. So nobody on the other mm. end of the uh, thing has to figure out anything special because it's Got you know, it. it'll look just like it just works. Yeah, it, it just works. works. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I'll have to mention that to Drea because I, I have Android, so I, I won't be able to do that myself. But, for, uh, for Android, uh, use Red Phone. Red phone. Red okay. phone, and there's an iOS app that pairs with Red phone called Signal. So if you're on Red phone, anybody with Signal or Red phone can call each other. So it's a cross platform version cool. of, of FaceTime audio. Very cool. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. Cool. Well, let's get to the interview. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Cheers. Hello, this is Lucas Carlson. And this is Elliot Packer. And this is the Crafts and Founder podcast. This week we've got an awesome guest for you, Mike Belsito, who wrote a really cool book, Startup Seed Funding for the Rest of Us, How to Raise a Million Dollars for Your Startup. Now, this is a really cool idea because he focuses not just on raising a million dollars for your startup in the Bay Area, but actually anywhere. Uh, he himself... Uh, raised outside of the Bay Area, which is uh, nice for me too because I'm based in Portland. Uh, my startup was based in Portland. Uh, I did end up raising money from the Bay Area and Seattle, but uh, being a Portland company, it, it wasn't the same. And, and so this book goes into some of those uh, ideas, and, and Mike has a background. In fact, Mike, thank you for being on. Can you tell us about your background? Yeah, and, and thank you both so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Uh, and yeah, I mean, as far as my background goes, I've been in startups for the past 10 years. So uh, right out of business school, I went to Case Western Reserve uh, University for business school uh, back in 2003 to 2005. And really, I joined a startup right out of, right out of school there. But I, I, I always like to say my first startup was actually while I was getting my MBA at Case. Uh, and the quick story there is just, I had approached uh, the athletic director at the time to see if I could intern in the athletic de department to try to get corporate sponsorships. 
And I had some experience interning in other corporate sponsorship groups, specifically when at, within athletics. And I had pitched her on this idea, and she said, well, Mike, that would be awesome, but we don't do corporate sponsorships. We're, we're a Division <laughs> three school. We don't, we don't have the money to hire somebody. We don't have the time to divert somebody away from that. And so I said, well, great, let me start it. And that wasn't my plan. It was more of a just sort of a knee-jerk response. But I thought, you know, hey, maybe I could create this program from the ground up. And and that's what I did. Within about 60 days, I ended up, you know, coming up with, hey, what would be the sponsorship inventory? How much would we sell it for? Who should the sponsors be? And then I actually went out and found those sponsors and raised about $30,000 in annual revenue for the school within the first couple of months, which at a place like Ohio State University, you know, that would be drop in the bucket. But at Case Western, you know, that's a football coach. So that was pretty meaningful. So that whole experience, you know, looking back, I mean, that was really my first startup. I just wasn't really thinking about it in that context at the time, and uh, but that got me interested in starting things. And so I found my first startup right out of business school, a company called Findaway World. Uh, we produce audiobooks called Playaway, uh, which are digital audiobooks, and had all sorts of roles. Uh, although the when title, was that? On, well, it, uh, what was Playaway? Yeah, when was it? Oh, when. So this is 2005. Uh-huh. Yeah, 2005. And the, the title on my business card at first was just Find a Wear. So, you know, it was, <laughs> I'm doing a little bit of everything. It's, it's very similar to probably many people's experience if they were employee number one at a startup. Uh, did, over- did, you go to, did you quit your job or was it right out of business school without even getting a job? It was right out of business. That was that was my first job, essentially. So right out of business school, my first job was being a find a wayer at Find a Way World. So uh, was employee number one. So I wasn't one of the co-founders, but I was the first person. You know, when they had enough guts to hire that first person, you know, I was that I was that person right out of school. Did so, your family like? Uh, were they scared that you weren't getting a traditional job? <laughs> you know, my dad. Always wanted. He was always the kind of person that wanted to push me into finance. You know, yeah. something much more traditional. <laughs> and he was super happy that I was going to business school. Once I started getting attracted to, you know, startups, he was he was a little bit on edge. But no, I I think he saw how happy and just how excited I was to be a part of creating something because that was really the thing for me. I wanted to be a part of creating something from scratch. And uh, he didn't put up too much of a fight. My I wasn't married at the time, but my girlfriend at the time who became my wife of now eight years, she was super supportive as well. So no, I had a pretty good support network. And uh, how did you find that first team? I mean, we, you know, we often hear from entrepreneurs who are looking for and sometimes struggling to find co-founders, right? But yeah. it's not as often that we actually hear from early employees. So how, you know, the find a way at the time wasn't a huge brand that you already knew everything about. So how did you guys connect paths in the first place? Yeah, the funny thing about it is, and this is proof that you just can't turn your back on any sort of opportunities or open doors. You know, business school, they always taught, well, hey, the best jobs are never posted. You know, it's all it's all about who you know. And and I, I do believe that to be true for the most part. In this case, I found them on an online job board. I mean, in this case, the <laughs> job was posted. And that's how I found out about them. And uh, but it was more once I met them, it was more the personal connection I had with them, where I realized right in that first meeting, uh, you know, it's it's three guys in a cramped office, and but I realized it was something special pretty much right away. But if I had listened to the folks at business school who were saying, you know, the best jobs are never posted, I would have never found out about it. So uh, while I agree with uh, the point of that notion, it's it's still. You know, I still believe you can't really turn your back on any sort of opportunity. So, so then, how did you? Uh, yeah, what, what happened next? So yeah, you were so, the first employee there, and, and then what? Yeah, so we we as a business uh, had a model that was pretty simple. We created this product called Playaway, which was a basically a, a digital audio player preloaded with audiobooks. So we licensed content from publishers. But then we would sell it into retailers, major bookstores, you know, at the time, Borders, Barnes & Noble, uh, Walmart. So it was a straightforward model. Uh, I guess the licensing of content made it somewhat unique, but it was fairly straightforward. My role in the beginning was a bit of everything, but part of it was, hey, Mike, see if you could drum up business anywhere else. 
So I started doing pilot programs with all sorts of, you know, what would be considered for us non-traditional channels. One of them, as an example, was a vending machine in San Francisco airport. Um, hmm. now, now they're actually pretty common, but this company, Zoom Systems, they created a branded vending machine for us at the airport, and uh, and, it, and it did okay, but it wasn't. You know, I wouldn't say it was a wild success. Uh, a couple other pilot programs with libraries and schools, and that that is where the whole course of the business really shifted for us because what happened is with retail we were just doing okay I mean if you think about it we had you know this much shelf space you know in Walmart right so we didn't do a lot of advertising and what we didn't do any advertising so we were kind of hoping that people stumbled upon our product and figured out what it was in a library what I learned was they had a major problem with audiobooks you know, audiobooks super popular to be circulated but an average audiobook is eight to ten hours, and that means it's eight to ten CDs. And if one of those discs gets scratched, you have to take the whole thing out of circulation. So our audiobooks, the playaways, were all preloaded onto one device, self-contained. They were really durable. So the libraries were blown away. Long story short, that channel became the primary channel for our business. Within two years, 99% of our business was in libraries, schools. Um, and then government too, actually Department of Defense, they would buy tens of thousands of units every month and send them to soldiers deployed overseas. So um, my role in the company evolved, I, it ended up building a sales team, managing that sales team, uh, then moved into product development because the question was, well, what's the next play away? And then something happened that was just totally not planned for and expected, and that was my cousin, uh, he died, and just completely out of the blue. and. You know, my family went through what a lot of families go through in that situation where you're just floored. You, you're trying to cope with that person being gone in the first place. But very quickly, you know, like a splash of cold water, we had to figure out, all right, well, what, you know, what do we do now? You know, what funeral home do we have to call? You know, what, how do we proceed with the services? And where he lived, there's six funeral homes within two miles. So the question for us wasn't just, you know, what's the number of the neighborhood funeral home? It was... How, how do we know which one to pick? And we ended up, you know, we didn't have time to call them all. We didn't have time to visit. We, we ended up picking one and just hoping for the best. But it didn't, you know, it didn't feel right. We didn't really have information that we were looking for. You know, we wanted to know what do other families have to say about these funeral homes? What, what are the pricing that they offer? How does that vary? And I remember being with my wife at dinner after the service took place where the only reason we were at that restaurant was because of reviews I read for it online. And that's when I realized just as a society, we have more information to decide where to spend $30, go to dinner, than we do planning something that's so much more important and more expensive, uh, like a funeral. I mean, average funeral, it's in the you know eight to $9,000 range. So that whole experience ended up being the catalyst for me and uh, my friend Brian, who I was working with at the time, he was actually the first software developer at Findaway. We started really uh, trying to learn more about this problem because it just felt like I, we didn't even think of it as, hey, let's start a business about this. It was just like, why does this problem exist? And ultimately, it, it became so important to us that we just figured, don't know what that solution is yet, but this is an important, this is a problem that's important enough for us to solve. And uh, in summer of 2011, you know, we had done enough research. We had, you know, talked to funeral homes, talked to families that we decided to apply to an accelerator program, and we made a challenge to ourselves, along with a couple of mentors that uh, we had at the time, that if we were to get into this accelerator program, this is it. We're going to take the leap and do this full time. And so we got in, and summer of 2011, we started what became E Funeral, and uh, and and that was a company that essentially the, the service that we launched with, you could think of it as almost like a Angie's List meets lending tree for funeral planning. Families would submit an inquiry, they would, the funeral homes would sign up to be in our network and uh, families would receive quotes and they could view those quotes, they could view the reviews and choose the funeral home that works best for them. Uh, and that, so that was the initial solution that we had launched. And the short story of eFuneral you know, in the time that we had three years, we, we did we raised close to a million dollars of uh, capitals, mostly from angel investors. There was one VC firm, 
Um, but we, we built this really awesome, useful service. We had hospice organizations all over the country recommending it. We had families using it. It was really helpful. We struggled, however, to prove out the right business model. And we found ourselves after three years in this really tough spot where we built something of use, but we weren't in a place where we had proven enough traction to get more investment. We didn't have the revenue coming in where we were a sustainable business. And so ultimately, we had to make a tough call. You know, what, what do we do next? And we ended up, uh, we were approached by a couple of companies, one of them that we ended up accepting an offer to sell uh, many of our assets to. It was not, I mean, to be upfront, this wasn't the kind of sale where I put off press releases and this wasn't a big win. It was just, hey, can we keep some of what we built alive and, um, you know, give something back to investors. And so about a year ago, um, that's what we ended up doing. And to, to kind of segue to the book I wrote, which is what you mentioned before, after that time that I closed down eFuneral, it was, uh, it was tough. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, well, what's, what's next for me? And I started writing more as just a cathartic experience, you know, just for my own benefit. But as I started writing, I, you know, what was popping into my mind were these coffee meetings that I had with other startup founders that I knew that they were asking me, well, Mike, you know, your experience was amazing no matter what, but how did you raise that million dollars? You know, we're, we're in Cleveland, Ohio. This isn't New York. It's not Silicon Valley. And, and it's a funeral company. Like, well, how did you do that? And I didn't have a great answer for them because I just hadn't thought about it in that context. But um, really, I as I was hearing that often, as I was starting to write, I thought, well, you know, it would be helpful if I could put some use to this writing, not just write for me, but what if I could help people? And so ultimately, I ended up writing what became Startup Seed Funding for the rest of us. Awesome. So let's cut to the chase. How do you raise seed funding when you don't have connections, when you don't know investors, uh, when you're not in Silicon Valley? Yeah. So there's a few things that I think are important for everybody to realize uh, because the, the game's kind of changed over the past few years. Right, first and foremost, you have to build something. I mean, that that's really, and this is different than maybe a few years ago where you could raise money on an idea, uh, but this, I would say, is the biggest myth today. Investors don't invest in ideas. They invest in tangible things that they can touch. That doesn't mean that you have to have launched your product or be live or you know have millions of users or anything like that, but at least a prototype, at least something that you could put in front of investors. So I, I'd say first things first, you, you have to... You have to show investors that you're not just all talk and that you actually have the wherewithal to create something that you could put in front of them. Um, so that's, that I'd say is right off the bat one of the first things. The other is, and this is where some founders get held up, at least I, you know, I could speak for my hometown of Cleveland, but I don't confine yourself to your own geography. You know, you think outside of your own geography. So, uh, you know, you had mentioned before, like, well, what if, what if you don't have connections? And so in many cases, the people I talk to, that is the case, right? Or maybe they have a few, you know, a handful of connections in their local market. And it's great to start in your local market because investors do like to invest kind of where, where they live, right? Or where they work, you know, areas that they're really familiar in. However, the problem comes in that certain markets are known for investors that like certain things. So for instance, I have, I have friends that have a consumer internet company and they're here in Cleveland, Ohio, and they struggled at first because they're just aren't, a, this, in Cleveland, um, you know, the town does really well for medical devices, um, healthcare, you know, that, that's along the lines of, you know, what Cleveland's known for now. Uh, it used to be, you know, heavy manufacturing, you know, other industries for sure. But consumer internet, that, that's not, that's not, you know, there haven't been a lot of entrepreneurs that have had successful starts and exits in the consumer internet market. So for that reason, there's also not a lot of angel investors that are attracted to that market either. For them in particular, they did get a couple of angel investors here in Cleveland, but they ended up raising a couple million dollars. The overwhelming majority came from outside of Cleveland. So I think opening up your mind to networking with people outside of uh, your own market is a really good idea. The, the problem is the next question that people ask me when I tell them that, which is, okay, I get it, Mike. I'll think outside of Cleveland. But if I didn't have many connections in Cleveland, I sure as heck don't have connections in 
New York or Silicon Valley or Austin or anywhere else. So this is where, and this, this is a, an important one, and it's one that like everybody can get going with now. But you use the tools that you have access to, that everybody has access to, to network, uh, but not maybe in the traditional way. So I, I LinkedIn, AngelList, and Twitter, those three platforms in particular, those, I've built so many relationships using those platforms uh, that today, I mean, I have a, a pretty good network. I have friends all over the country, but that I didn't meet in person originally. I met through these platforms, including investors. Um, so, you know, how I like, some people when I say like AngelList and LinkedIn, they think, oh, okay, so I find them and then I just message them through the platform. And that is not usually what I think works well. That That's not what worked well for me. Um, instead, what I would do is is engage at first. So use a platform like Twitter to actually engage with the people that you're interested in. Um, and you could find out who the right investors are for you, maybe through AngelList and LinkedIn. Like, for instance, I think everybody should have their dream team of investors. And it's not just like name brand people. It's, it's investors that have certain characteristics that your specific startup would benefit from. So you could search for those characteristics on AngelList, LinkedIn. Then go to Twitter though, find out if they're on and actually engage with them, like follow them, like talk with them as they're posting articles, you know, interact with them. Um, just as an example, uh, it, David Cohen, right? He's the founder and CEO of Techstars. Uh, he didn't invest in eFuneral, however, he came really close to, and he certainly evaluated eFuneral. I reached out to him at first through Twitter. That's how that connection came. And now, even though he didn't invest in eFuneral, he turned it into somebody for me that I can bounce ideas off of from time to time. Uh, for the book, for instance, when I started writing the book, he was one of the people that I was able to turn to and was able to profile in the book. Uh, but if I had not used those platforms at all, there's there's no way David Cohen would would be in my network. So. Those, I would say, are, you know, those are definitely the, the top few tips I would have that come to mind. I think that that makes so much sense. Uh, and it also jives with my experience. Uh, for me, I spent a little bit of time trying to find investors in Portland, but I quickly realized that, that that's not going to uh, be the easiest way. It's not going to be the most successful way. Uh, so I spent a lot of time thinking outside of Portland for fundraising, even though I still planned to stay in Portland to run the company. Now, that wasn't easy. Uh, certainly, uh, most of the investors I talked to would have preferred me to move, and a lot of them asked me to. Uh, but in the end, I end up raising $10 million, and, and they, you know, the, the people who gave me money didn't uh, care that I was in Portland. Didn't, they actually thought it was a benefit because I could hire programmers for cheaper. Yeah. Um, and so totally jives with, with my experience. And also, uh, what you said about engaging with the people instead of emailing them, pitching them, uh, it, I can tell you that, um, from my experience being an angel on angel list, uh, I do very frequently get cold pitches uh, on angel list and I just don't have time, uh, especially for people that, that I've never met. I, I often take a look at what they're doing, even when they cold pitch me, but often I don't have time to really dedicate into diligence. And But when people uh, spend time to cultivate a relationship with me, uh, that's completely different. Um, whether that's engaging on Twitter, uh, whether that's figuring out how to become part of my life, uh, uh, add value, um, support what I'm doing, uh, those little things set you apart. I get fruit, like pitches uh, every week from multiple uh, startups, uh, cold pitches, but very rarely does anybody uh, start to engage with me. Uh, so it really sets you apart. Well, and I also think it's, it's not a transactional thing, right? Or that at least that shouldn't be how people think about it. I mean, for me, I just love meeting cool new people. And, and so genuinely, like there are people that I wanted to get to know more. Like David Cohn, that's an example. And not to say I'm like super close friends with David Cohn by any means, but he's somebody that I just thought this would be an awesome person to have in my network. I would love somebody like David to give me feedback when I would ask for it. It wasn't a matter of, uh, well, if I send him five tweets, 
maybe he'll invest in my startup. Yeah. So I think it's also like going in with that mindset. Yes. Uh, if, if you have the transactional mindset, I don't think you'd have as much success with it. You wouldn't. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Uh, what do you wish you knew uh, when you were just getting started? <laughs> wow. There are, there are probably a, a handful of things that come to mind right away. But I think one of the things I'd say is that you really need to commit to the process when you are going through fundraising. And that's something that uh, it, it's easy to say and it's even easy to, to you know, try to think about. But to really understand it, it's almost impossible uh, until you actually go through it. So I had the benefit of having amazing mentors and they had raised capital in the past, had successful exits in the past, and they gave me that feedback. So I even knew that going into it, but then once you experience it, it's, it's a whole new ball game. Um, I think it's really easy for founders to say, well, look, I just wanna code. I just wanna build product. That's what I love to do. Let me do that. And the reality is if you're in the space where you determine we absolutely need capital at this point, which by the way, I don't think should be the case for many people. Like, I, mean, I don't think everybody needs capital when they think they need capital. But if you've made that decision, then you have to commit to it. And that probably means putting half, if not more of your time into the fundraising process, which includes setting up coffee meetings with other entrepreneurs, uh, asking them about their experiences with uh, investors that, you know, maybe are on your list of dream team investors, right? Um, putting together that list, maybe reaching out to entrepreneurs that aren't in your network at all, trying to get to know them uh, to then get feedback on those investors as well. Uh, setting up more coffee meetings, you know, then putting together the pitch deck. Those are all the things that uh, people don't think about when they're getting started. Uh, and it's a lot of like nuts and bolts type stuff, but those are the things that are really important. Awesome. Uh, well, it has been awesome having you on this podcast, and uh, I think your experience is really not only you're your a great example of how possible it is to break down kind of the concepts uh, of being not in the Bay Area and, and how do you fundraise if you've never done it before. I think that a lot of people are so intimidated by those concepts and you are a shining example of uh, that it's absolutely possible and a lot of the fears that, that founders have when they're thinking about entrepreneurship are not based in reality. That You can overcome a lot of these things that you think uh, are, are really big fears. So I really appreciate you coming on. So. I really recommend you pick up Startup Seed Funding for the rest of us. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's a really good book, and thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much, Lucas. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Craftsman Founder Podcast with Lucas Carlson. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, craftsmanfounder.com, to your friends and colleagues. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a Craftsman Founder production. Join us next time for another edition of the Craftsman Founder podcast.